So with that, Kat Thompson. Thank you and welcome, welcome to the Lake Harriet Spiritual Community today. I'm so happy to see so many people here today. So I spent two weeks working on a handout. I'm, I really need structure. As a creative person, I find that I have to have structure or I get um, panicky, right? So I, so I spend a lot of time when I do these talks to build little structures in five minute increments about how I'm gonna speak and what I'm gonna talk about and how it's gonna flow And this morning. Right before I went to print it off, I lost the entire document. And every bit of information that I had been collecting over the past two months um, from the internet and stuff was gone. Everything, I couldn't even rebuild it. And so I was in a panic and I went to the ancestor altar and said, what is this about? What's happening? And they said, you're talking about personal power today? Let's just see how strong yours is. <laughs> So part of what I do when I speak in a group is I open up what's called a coning ahead of time, and I ask that I am able to say what each person in this room needs to hear. So today, I'm going to be just as interested to see what comes out of my mouth as you are. <laughs> and I would like to leave a little bit of time at the end for Q&A, because I find a lot of times that questions and answers are much more appropriate when I'm giving a talk so that if people have something specific they need an answer to, I can address that. So, uh, 2020 vision, what's that look like? Here we are, new year, new decade, new paradigm shift. And, hi, Marsha. <laughs> and um, we're at a critical point in, in the evolution of the human race. We either have to get it together right now or we might as well just bag it. And there are days when I look at my daughter and I go, this, the, the collapse of civilization cannot come fast enough for me. And then there are other days where I'm so excited and so hopeful and so inspired by what I see happening around me. So I'm gonna talk about, from my area of expertise, what I think needs to happen for all of us. And because I think that light workers in particular tend to fall into the trap of forgetting that their blind spots might actually be creating the very thing that they're fighting against. How many people feel like there's some truth to the fact that light workers might be causing some of the problems that we're experiencing right now? And it's not that they're doing it or not that we're doing it on purpose. It's unconscious. This is how emotion works. Emotion is a, an electromagnetic field, and it's, it's the magnetic, I'd like to really focus on the magnetic part of that. When you feel strongly about something, you have energy invested in it, okay? The laws of attraction say that strong emotion and focus and attention is what brings something into manifestation. What is everybody focusing on right now? The impeachment hearings, the circus, why is the circus getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Because people have been pulling their attention out of it. And as you pull your attention out of something, it literally loses its ability to stay in manifestation. Emotion is what manifests anything into 3D. The stronger you feel about something, the faster it will come in, and the more attention you pay to it, the longer it will stay in 3D. Okay, does that make sense? So if you're focusing your attention on what you don't like, what's gonna happen? You're feeding it, you're actually keeping it going, you're feeding it. And when structures that have been in place for a long time that are used to stealing your attention and stealing that energy and using it for their own good instead of the good of the whole, when you begin to pull your energy out, they feel that because there is this wobbling and this thing that starts to happen. And one of the first things that happens is what's being hidden becomes revealed. And what's, what are we seeing in the last few years? The Catholic Church, the pedophilia, the, the, the child sex trade, the sex trade in general, the war against the feminine, all that stuff is starting to show itself in all of its ugliness because the ability to keep it hidden is collapsing as we pull our attention and as we pull our energy and as we pull our belief out of those structures, we get to see what they're really built of. 
You know how the trees all lose their leaves in the, in the winter and you get to actually see the form of the tree and you can look at a tree and go, oh my goodness, that limb is broken and that limb is deformed and you know I might need to get up there and prune that thing before the leaves come back. And then the leaves come out in the summer and you forget about it until the leaves fall off again. Well, we are in the winter of American culture right now and we are having an opportunity to see exactly the shape and the form of what has been given to us as a reality. And we have a choice about saying yes or no to that reality. So let's talk about personal power. What is personal power? Does anybody have anything they'd like to throw out? What is your definition of personal power? Boundaries. Say boundaries. boundaries. What else? Capacity to influence. Capacity to influence. What else? Competence. Competence. Excellent. What else? Goals. Goals. Autonomy. Sorry? Autonomy. Autonomy. Perfect. All right. Pardon me? Take action, okay. All really good descriptive words that, dis that talk about personal power. In my opinion, personal power is the ability to move through life always being safe, trusting yourself in the world around you, and always being able to manifest the resources you need when you need them. That to me is the definition of personal power. Now how do we abdicate personal power? So I was telling uh, a friend of mine who's 93 yesterday this story. And, I, and the thing about stories that's so interesting is that the context and perception of the story itself can direct the, the conversation about the story. So the story was about when I was growing up, there were eight kids in my family, and we are all pretty close in, in, in uh, age, so we were like a little tribe of wild savages, and we really were wild. <laughs> and my parents despaired they tried everything they could think of to take the wildness out of us, to break our spirit. And they were unable to because there were too many of us and we bonded together. And so they basically threw their hands up. But what they were really saying was, we trust that your personal power is strong enough to keep you safe. And we release ourselves from having anything to do with it. So my dad loved to fish, so on Saturdays, he would take us to Lake Malalu, Malalu in Hudson or someplace on the St. Croix River, and he would drop us off, and then he would go away and fish and leave these eight kids here. So the first thing we would do is we'd find a log, a big log that floated, and the, the older kids would tow that log out to the middle of the lake. The younger kids who couldn't swim, we would tie empty Hilux jugs on their backs so they couldn't drown, and then we'd drag them out to the log, and we would spend the entire day on that log in the middle of the water, jumping in, playing mermaids, chasing each other. It was fabulous. And my dad would come back about 5 o'clock at night with a bunch of fish, and we'd cook them up, and he'd take the lunch that my mom had packed out of the car, and we'd ravenously eat everything because we were so hungry, and then we'd go home. And my friend said to me, wow, y your father would <laughs> get arrested for that today. And I said, wouldn't he? And I said, because today we have been convinced that our children have no personal power to keep themselves safe. And when you abdicate your personal power, you have to have more police. You have to have more authority to try to keep you safe. And can you see how since we were, since my generation, the baby boomers, each generation has very subtly been convinced that they don't have enough personal power to keep them safe. So more and more of your resources are being spent to try to keep you safe in a world that looks increasingly unsafe, right? So when I was 45, I got in my car, sold everything, got in my car and drove to Mexico because the wild part of me was dying. And climate change, in my opinion, has very little to do with carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and all. Climate change has to do with ungrounded wild energy. As we cut down the wilderness, where does the wild go? It's right now, it's just rampaging around the world, but it also comes into your kids. <laughs> it comes into your pets. It comes into yourself. 
And I have had a really, because of my upbringing, because of the fact that I grew up in the woods, I grew up on the Mississippi River, and my parents just let us be savages, I have always had this really strong, wild p part of myself. And when I was 45, when I was 44, I was dying. I was like, hated my work, I was just done, I couldn't see any way off the hamster wheel. I owed money, I had to work to pay that, you know, I couldn't, I, it was a, a self-feeding machine. I had to work to pay the bills, and there wasn't any way out of it. <clears throat> and then one morning, the ancestors whispered in my ear and said, if you sold everything, you could pay off all your bills and then you could go to Mexico. And I was like, what a great idea. So I took that year to get everything settled, got in my car, drove away, driving down 35E, December 16th, it was my 45th birthday, screaming and crying as I'm leaving my boyfriend behind on the phone. What was I thinking? What was I thinking? And he's saying, please turn around and come back. And I'm like, I can't. I just can't. And so I went, and that five years that I stayed down there gave me my wild back. And, it, and, and I came back when I ran out of money. And I was like, oh, now I don't have any money left. I've got to start something new. So I'm not afraid of losing everything because I trust my personal power. I'm getting a little dry here. <laughs> I trust my personal power to be able to manifest what I need when I need it. And that's not to say I haven't had a tremendous amount of help along the way, I have. But that's part of your personal power. And one of the lies that we have been given in this culture is that not only do you have to do it yourself, but you can do it yourself. No, we can only do it with each other. Part of the reason you have to have community is that you cannot see your blind spots. And it is your blind spots that are sabotaging you. So we need people who love us and can compassionately say, excuse me, Kat, your words and your actions are not matching. You might want to look at that. And when we don't have that, when we don't have people who will check us with love, we just go off and flail ourselves into situations that can be incredibly difficult to get out of and very traumatic to our emotional body. So I'm going to come back to emotion. Um, emotion, if emotion is the um, energy of manifestation, of bringing into manifestation what you desire, then we all know how to f focus that emotional energy consciously. <clears throat> but what about our unconscious feelings? What about when we get triggered by something and we have a reaction and we feel helpless to do anything about it? So somebody throw out something that, you know, they see every single day that just makes them go, <gasps> and they feel like they can't do anything about it. Trump? <laughs> is, is, that what they, is, is that what I heard? Traffic, Traffic. thank you. <laughs> Traffic. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All I heard was tr. <laughs> Trump out there too. Okay, that's good. We'll take both of those. Uh, let's go with Trump first. First of all, Trump is the reflection of our unconscious creations. Trump is our blind spot, okay? There would not be any power there if every single one of us was taking responsibility for how we feel. And in my book, the thing that I say, if there's one thing that you get out of my book, it's how to deal with your anger. And when I talk about dealing with anger, I am not talking about managing it. You cannot manage any emotion, but you certainly cannot manage anger. What you can do is you can become friends with it and you can let it take you on a magnificent journey of expressing through your body the anger that you feel. And the thing that emotion does when it's ex expressed in a sacred way is that there is a transformation that occurs. If you, so let's say that I'm, I, I see something about Trump that just, I, I can't use Trump because I don't get triggered by him, but let, what, I, what I do get triggered by is, <laughs> I do get triggered by people 
who make comments that they don't have anything to do with what's happening. And I'm like, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> and so then what I can do is that I can pick up my rage doll and I can beat it up and scream and holler and let my body act that out because your body's hardwired to hit when it's angry, if you didn't know that. Um, and when I get done, when I no longer have a charge about something, it means I've taken, so I've uninvested. When I no longer have a charge about that, it means I no longer have any energy invested in, in there, and that's my unconscious energy. I'm not investing in that energy on purpose, it's unconscious. So not only is it coming back to me, but as it comes back to me, it tells me consciously, here's how you are co-creating that. Here's how you have been co-creating that. So when you do emotional expression in a sacred manner, you literally pull your energy out of these structures that are profane, that are not healthy for anybody, that are hurting people and the planet. You pull your own energy out of that and you get an understanding about how you have been partnering in the creation of that very thing. So if you don't have a charge about something, don't bother with it, you don't have any energy there. But if you have a charge, you have some energy there. <clears throat> so traffic. Traffic's frustrating, I agree. I try not to drive. <laughs> um, and there's, when you're in personal power, two things happen. You rarely get stuck in traffic. And when you do, you have something interesting that's going on inside of you that or you're singing, or there, you're not, there's no, nothing triggers you about traffic. <clears throat> and so if you're being triggered by something, it's just an indication that there's something going on inside of you. I often will use, if I'm triggered, I have road rage to beat the band, I'll tell you. That's one of the reasons I try not to drive very much. Um, but I've learned that that's just a flag that I'm mad about something else. And so if I'm stuck in traffic, that's a really good time for me to go in and go, okay, and I just go, why are you so mad? Why are you so mad? And then I just wait to see what comes out of my mouth. And something will always come out of my mouth. And oftentimes, by the time I get done saying it, I'm crying. Because there's always grief under anger. There's always grief under anger. And so if you can get to the grief, that means you're at the beginning. Grief comes from belief systems that don't serve you. When you are invested in a belief system that does not serve your soul, grief is how you pull it out. And so when you're angry, if you express your anger, you will almost always end up in grief, and when you express your grief, you reset. You find yourself resetting into a place that has more personal power, and more personal power, and more personal power. Who's heard of Haya Pony Popo? And I'm, okay. I've, I've heard it pronounced a number of different ways, so you may have heard it pronounced a different way, but I saw a, a, a native Hawaiian woman saying, no, this is how you say it. And I wrote it down and practiced saying it over and over and over so I could say it correctly. Hayaponipopo is a, an ancient Hawaiian shamanic technique of healing based on rec reconciliation and forgiveness. And I have been, I found that my mom died in, in December, and it was really hard for me to like, find a place of, okay, today I feel like I'm gonna grieve for my mom. It didn't work like that for me. What happened was I just was really raw, and then things would, I knew I had to cry, and I couldn't find it. I just couldn't get there. So I was like, well, I know what will make me cry, and that is rescue videos. Animal rescue videos will make me cry. <laughs> And so what I did, so what I found is that if I went and started watching animal rescue videos, as the tears came, I began to practice Hayaponipopo, and I would say, I am so sorry, please forgive me, to the animal, to the, the land, to the earth, to the whatever was in distress, I took responsibility for causing that. And I apologized and asked for forgiveness and then said, I love you and thank you. Those are the four things of Hayaponipopo. Please forgive me, I'm sorry, I love you, thank you. And so what happened was that my grief felt like it was making a difference. I wasn't just crying because I was weepy, I was 
doing something with that grief to make a change. And so that's my new sort of meditation is get on, watch rescue videos and cry. <laughs> <laughs> and there's something really, when I first heard about that practice, the idea of, so, that, so someone would come to you as a healer and as a healer you would say to the, to the person's body, I am so sorry for causing this disease. Please forgive me. I love you. And they would heal. Can you imagine how powerful that is? But we, but we have not been taught to take responsibility. This is one of the things when you abdicate personal power, you also abdicate personal responsibility because somebody else is telling you what to do and somebody else is making it easy for you to do it and somebody else is setting up the rules, right? Well, if somebody else is setting up the rules, I'm not responsible if things go away, if things go awry. And how many people get so angry because they spend all this money on insurance and then the insurance companies deny them? And you're like, but I gave you my personal power to take care of me and you're not taking care of me. I'm gonna kill you, <laughs> right? And so that's another way that the, the, that the culture has tricked us into giving over what should belong to us by right, which is our ability to move through life safely. And if we, I remember I had a, an assistant when I was in the film industry, and we made a lot of money in the film industry, so I didn't have health insurance because I just paid cash when I went and had to go in for something. And she was so mad one day, and she was yelling about having a mammogram, and it would cost $600, and she was fighting with her insurance company. I was like, you can make $600 in two days. Like, I don't understand. <laughs> Why is this a problem for you? Because she didn't want to believe that she could create the resources she needed when she needed them. She wanted to believe that she was paying somebody else to take care of any problems that were gonna come up. And it seemed really backwards to me. Sorry, I'm really dry. Is it dry in here? Ah, uh, okay. It's not just me. <laughs> um, so, personal power, high and pony. And then I, I wrote out three cards today. Personal power, high pony popo, and the third one, I lost them when I got here. They're like, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> um, OK, so I think at this point I'd like to ask for questions, because questions can kind of help steer the conversation to a place. And if, you're ask if you have a question, you can, you can trust that there will be more than one person in the room who has the same question. So does anybody have a question? And if so, she'll bring you the microphone. Hi, I'm Patrice. So hi, Patrice. Hi, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I lived in California, and I'm from Minnesota, so I came back here about a year and a half ago, and I was sleeping Beauty in Duluth, where I literally slept for a year and a half. Um, I came down here, and within the first two weeks, um, I met great people, and then my wallet was stolen, and then my wallet came back to me, but that person wanted me to pay for it. And so this whole reality was, I'm a Kripalu yoga teacher, so I didn't know how to wrap my mind around what had happened. So I guess my question is, um, yeah, I, if I have personal power, then how did something like that. So all that happened was someone helped me push my car and they were going somewhere so I offered them a ride and in three minutes, the time that it took for me to drive them there, they took my wallet and now I'm in a different place with it but it was, <coughs> I cried for like three hours because I just, this is not my world, this is not my reality. So anyhow, what, if you have any anything to say, I would be grateful. Okay, thank you. And it is your reality, isn't it? Because it happened. <laughs> it, yeah, so, so, so that's so interesting because this is the very thing that I was talking about earlier with lightworkers who say that's not my reality. And yet it is your reality because we're all here. We're living in it, right? One of the things that I will say is, 
First, let me ask you a question. After you cried for three hours, what happened? Okay. Did you? I'm sorry. I went from absolute sadness back into wait a second. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Because what she just described was she had an emotional expression that lasted for three hours and it took her to a place of power. Right? Loss is meant to be grieved. When you are holding grief that does not get expression, you will create more and more intense experiences until you sit down and cry. You cannot move beyond your feelings. This whole academic idea of managing your emotion just makes me crazy. <laughs> it's one of my triggers because it's like, no, no, the most emotionally intelligent people on the planet live on the street because they have to be so aware of every single bit of energy that's around them, right? And so when we grow up in these structures that say you need to sit still for eight hours a day, it's not appropriate to express your anger, it's not appropriate to raise your voice, it's not appropriate to call somebody out when they're doing something, it's not appropriate, it's not appropriate, it's not appropriate. What happens is your emotional body gets shut down and we will, it will always look for ways to trigger you into the original wound. The original wound that never got healed will keep repeating itself throughout your life until you finally go back and feel it. And I know this is not news to any of us. We are at a time, though, in, I think, the evolution of the human species where if we don't really step up and practice that, we're done. And that's okay because we'll show up somewhere else in some other form. But it seems a shame that with all the amazing things that we've created right up until now, it would be a shame if we weren't able to actually follow through on all those great ideas. You know, it seems like we're kind of in this place where are we going to be able to implement all these amazing new innovative ideas that people have been bringing forward? Or are we going to, you know, just wipe herself out? Yes. Uh, you, you'll need to use the microphone. Sorry. Just the end of all of this, I know that, one, it was a lesson from the universe just gently reminding me there are different realities of people. Better to learn it now than later and also like you said it was grief which is why I and now I'm like I got this okay so two things the universe does not care about you personally is that a is that a surprise to anybody here the universe does not care about you personally I was on a shamanic journey one time and I was way out in hyperspace doing this work and um, and I was introduced to the creator energy. And the first thing that I noticed was that it really didn't care about me personally. And I had this intense reaction of anger because it was my birthright that creator cared about me, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> that was part of my story. And it was good for me to realize that the universe, the creator, whatever, doesn't care about me personally. I'm like a cell in the body. You know, you don't go in your body and try to find that one little cell that's doing such a great job and go, you know, thank you so much for leading the way. No, that isn't how it works. <laughs> that's why we have to be in community because it's the community of cells that keeps you healthy, okay? The second thing is the sacred agreement you had with those people who stole your wallet was I will trigger you into grief because you clearly need to cry. There is always a sacred agreement. So it's not, when you said those people, you right away said, I'm not, re that has nothing to do with me. I'm not in that reality. That's not my, and th but oh yes, that's a sacred agreement for them to cause something big enough for you 
to be able to cry so that you could find some personal power that had been missing. So the whole situation, that person should get a thank you. <laughs> See, we, we hate it when our, when our, when our, when our, our, our beliefs get challenged like that. We're like, no, then everything I believe my whole life, I have to go back. Yes, you have to go back and say, okay, where else have I been lied to? Yeah. Woke you up. <laughs> woke you up and gave you some personal power back. Okay, does anybody else have a question? I feel like, yes, I, you're welcome. Thank you for sharing. I love questions and answers. Hi. Hi. I'm Kyleen. Hi, Kyleen. Hi. Um, so I kind of have two questions. Um, emotions are so, everyone's talking about them now. Um, and so a lot of things I hear, you know, talks about moving through the emotions or how when you don't. Um, and so I listen to this and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not dealing with my emotions. And I'm like, well, wait, maybe I am. So now I don't even know if I'm always dealing with my emotions <laughs> or if I just listen to that and then I think. So I guess my question is kind of like, how do you know that you're dealing with your emotions in a healthy way? Okay, so in my, opi in my opinion, thank you for the question. That's a really great question. In my opinion, a healthy, uh, a way of, of being with your emotions in a healthy, a healthy and sacred way is by giving them non-judgmental expression. I work with five master emotions. They are grief, fear, anger, joy, and empathy. The first three usually get our attention the, the biggest, grief fear, and joy, grief, fear, and anger. How do you deal with grief? You cry. You cry, you sit down, you make a point of crying. You cry, you let your body, and sometimes when I'm crying, I, I literally can't even speak. I'm just like cho so choked up and so, like a baby cries, right? When you watch, I actually learned a lot about emotional expression by watching children. I went to them with my notebook and watched them, and I was like, ooh, I had a great teacher for anger. She was three years old, she was masterful. She would stand there and scream, and you could see steam coming out of her ears. And she'd scream, and her parents would get so, you know, like trying to stop. I'd be, no, no, let her go, let her go. And then afterwards, I'd say to her, why were you so angry? And she'd go, what? She didn't remember because it wasn't in her energy field anymore. She had already transformed it and, was, and had moved on to personal power. Fear, people have a... a often have a challenge expressing fear. My two, the two things I suggest for fear is write it on a piece of paper. Fear has a whole lot of power because it lives in what if, right? And you cannot do anything about what if. All you can do is be fr afraid of it. And so it's out here, all, it wakes you up at, at two o'clock in the morning, goes, what if? What if, you're living, what if you lose everything and you have to live in your car? What if that job doesn't come in and you're gonna have to, right? You can't do anything about that. Eight and a half by 11 is a structure that's in 3D. You write your fear on that and it loses its power. And it doesn't want power, it wants to give you information. So when it's on a piece of paper, your logical brain goes, oh, I know how to handle that could do that. Oh, no, that's not going to be a problem. Like your logical brain just immediately starts looking for solutions. So the other thing about fear is shaking. Fear, sh your body shakes when fear is leaving it. So I like to suggest to people like practice standing on one leg until you're shaking or do some kind of physical or sit on the floor and rock or get into the child's pose and just feel the fear and then Sometimes I'll feel, I'll feel the shake start like within a muscle and then I'll just exaggerate it. And I'll just start doing this. And then that's how fear leaves the body. Fear is actually just information that's way out here and so it's too big for us to do anything with. And then anger, your body's hardwired to hit. So um, big boxes, kicking big boxes and screaming and yelling. I have rage dolls, I beat the shit out of them. <laughs> Um, some people like to break stuff when they're angry, so if you can do that safely and sacredly. So does that answer your question? You're welcome. 
Okay, so then back to the grief, um, because that was my other one, um, because you say cry, and I, you know, as a child, I was the crybaby, and, you know, I was always told to stop, and so it's basically been conditioned into me since a young age not to cry. Um, My mom passed away in almost four years ago now, and that's kind of like the last time I've really cried, (laughs) and um, it's like, I feel like I always have to hold it together. I'm a single mom. Um, and so it's just like, how do you really get to that? Like, I try, I'm doing Watch the rescue work. videos. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, seriously, it, the thing is that maybe you don't have any grief <clears throat> that's backed up. But if you know that you do and you, f- and you can feel it, then find something that makes you cry. You know, go find somebody, go talk to a homeless person and ask them how they ended up homeless. And sometimes that, that'll do it. There's all kinds of ways that you can consciously trigger yourself into an emotional reaction. And that's where the power lies. It's that conscious triggering. If you're, if you're unconsciously triggering, you're reacting. So it's about taking, taking responsibility to make it happen. So find something that can make you cry and trigger yourself. Yes. Hi. My name is Ella. I was grow up in Siberia and Russia, so um, I very was wild person. <laughs> I understand you so deep because I was wild. I was go by myself. Nobody care of me. As I was grow in small place at very powerful place. Energy of Tibet, you know, Tibet, Altai, south of Siberia. at very powerful Shambhala energy. Yes, yeah. You know Shambhala. Yes, I do. <laughs> so, and. It was amazing, nature amazing, mm, uh, and I was sitting in school. I was seven years old, eight years old. I was sitting in school. I cannot study anything because <laughs> of power outside. I feel, okay. and I cannot focus. Okay. And do you have a question? Uh, yeah, okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I just, I just w- wanted to make sure. I'm sorry. I uh, just tell small my personal story, and I, I have one. I know how heal a little bit your kind of grief or you need to lay down once in a while in the land. You need to go park on nature and just lay down snow and the land. It, okay. it's, it feel mother <coughs> land, it yep. heal you. It suck all yep. the, your negative energy, give you a lot of power. Sometimes I'm tired, I just lay down in the forest or park for a while and Feel connection to mothers. It suck all the your all okay. what you talk about. Send thank you, and and thank you for bringing that up because I did want to touch on um, our your connection with nature here today. Your body is a microcosm of the world. Your body is literally a microcosm of the world. Where are you fracking? Where are you mining? What kind of pollution are you putting in your body? Everything that you do to your temple gets reflected outside of you. The, the choice of foods that you eat, how they were grown, what kind of consciousness went into the creation of them, all of that makes a difference. And so we can do a lot of the external healing that we see outside of us that we're grieving about. We can do a lot of that work by taking better care of our own temple, by treating our bodies with respect and with love. I, I'm leaving on Tuesday for five weeks in Mexico, and I told my body last night, I'm like, I know, I've really been neglecting you, but this next five weeks is for you, honey. <laughs> and I'm going to swim and walk and, you know, just go and be in the jungle and have adventures and, and let nature fill me, because it's very hard in the winter here for me to get that nature connection. So I leave every year so that I can do that. Oh, one more question back there. Yes. I hear a lot about crying and stuff in, in through grief and other things. What about tears of joy? How, mo- how much you address that? Because often you'll see something that does just bring a tear to your eye. To your eye Thank you. What a great question. <laughs> grief and joy feel exactly the same when you have no charge. The tears of joy come as quickly and as easily as the tears of grief. And when you have no charge, they don't feel any different. It is our perception of our feelings that causes us to have either pain or just let it move through us as a, as a wave of something. 
So I find myself having tears of, I don't even, wouldn't call them tears of joy or tears of grief, but just weeping because something moves me. And that weeping because something moves you is ultimately what weeping is for, because you're moved by something. Grief tends to be when we've packed it up and we've packed it up and we, and then it gets all these layers of, of language about it and stories behind it. And then it hurts. And then it hurts badly. But when we can just let it go. I have a, a friend who <coughs> I've been working with for a year, <coughs> excuse me, who's been really struggling with grief. <coughs> and, um, oh my goodness, I have a frog in my throat. <coughs> me yesterday and and for a year she'll call me and she'll be in this place where she can barely speak and she so doesn't want to be alive and she's and so I just hold space this is one thing that I think is really important for us to learn we have to learn to hold space for other people's emotional expression so I have friends who when I start on that route, they immediately try to deflect me. Oh, and they try to talk about that higher. Oh, well that person clearly, you know, didn't understand or didn't have the support. It's like, that's not about them. It's about me, what I'm feeling right now. Um, so what you can do is that you can just hold space for somebody and let them grieve and let them scream and let them cry and let them talk about how they want to be dead. And I just held the space for her and I kept thinking, I don't understand where the root of this is. Why don't I understand where the root of it is? Because we can't do anything until we get to the root of it, and it's been a year now. And then she started telling me about her mother's death and that her father was incapable of telling the hospital to, um, to pull the plug, which is what her mother's wishes were, and that she had to step in and become the adult and watch her mother die. And she never got a chance to just be a child who lost her mother. And so... She cried and I cried with her for like 20 minutes and I could feel that whole situation shift. I said, honey, you're just a child who lost your mom and you never got to cry about it. Now you get to cry about it. You shouldn't have had to step in and take over. That was not your job. So we have to be open to creating space for people without having to fix them or without having to define what their experience is. Emotions don't need a story. They just need to be expressed. The story is what keeps them from transforming and evolving. So let go of the story and just get into the feeling. You had a question? There, there she is. Yeah, I think this is a perfect compliment to what you're just talking about, but I find it challenging to be to hold space or to actually have a, a better understanding of holding space when people or other people around me are having very high intense emotions because I can be a very good observer of that but then it seems to break down connection with them. So I'd like you to talk about empathy and holding space and how to be in a place that actually facilitates people moving through um, So your, qu your question is how to how to hold space and be, the relationship between holding space and empathy and um, staying in connection with people that are going through those high emotions because okay. I tend to withdraw. Okay, thank you, that's a great question. And then as soon as I answer that question, we're gonna, we're gonna break and go for the offering. Um, so this friend that I was telling you about, she's quite a big girl and um, she gets very, almost angry when she has these intense emotions. And what I've suggested to her boyfriend is to hold her and she will try to fight you. She's not gonna hurt you, but she'll try, but you need to just hold her like you would hold a baby and say, it's all gonna be okay because I trust your personal power. It's all gonna be okay because I trust your personal power and you can trust your personal power. Okay, we need human touch. And what better way to help somebody than to put your arms around them and say, I trust you, and I trust the way that you move through the world, and it's all going to be okay. And I'm right here. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Okay, great. I mean, there are other ways you can do it, but that's, I think, probably the quickest. Yeah. If you want to enact change. 
<laughs> That's your left brain, yeah. And uh, un unfortunately, emotion doesn't respond to logic. Emotion is not logical. Hello? <laughs> it's not logical. So you can't approach it in a logical manner and expect to have good results. Okay, so it's time for the offering, and I would like to um, just encourage everybody to support the Lake Harriet community because here we are able to come into this beautiful space in community, support each other, move through what's happening in the world, and, be, and the, the ability to have a beautiful space like this is worth our support. So there's my little pitch for throwing some money in the basket. <laughs> And let's go all the way around the room, so make sure you've got enough space between people so um, you're feeling your personal bubble. Can you guys tighten up to, at that end a little bit? Okay, so you're gonna put your left palm up, just in a comfortable position, and you're just gonna hold it there. And with your right hand, you're gonna go to the person on your right, over their left palm, and you're just gonna move your hand until you feel the energy connection. Everybody feel that? Ooh, it is very powerful today, ho oh, hoo So now the energy comes into the body on the left side and goes out of the body on the right side. So what we're gonna do, nope, don't move your left hand at all, that's my job. I move my, you just move your right hand. Okay. The energy is going to go around the circle coming in to the left side of your body. You're going to pass it through your heart, give it a little bit of a boost with some heart energy and pass it out to the right. And so you can follow your own energy around the circle. And each time it comes back around, you're going to give it a little more of a boost with the heart energy. And let's have this heart energy specifically be about loving ourselves enough to believe that we deserve to have everything we desire. And that we are free. Freedom to love and to freedom to be loved. And you can watch the energy of this circle expanding outside the building, expanding through the city, expanding through the entire metro area, expanding through the country, expanding around the globe, and out into space. And now we're gonna take a deep inhale and on the exhale, bring your hands together like you're holding a ball. And that's your own little piece of this group energy right here that's filled with the love of every person in this room. And you're going to take that ball of energy and you're just going to squish it right over your heart. Thank you all very much for coming today. It was a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>